and welcome, and thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Afshar, Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce, and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Ray, myself, and our distinguished guests your questions live using hashtag Disrupt TV, and we'll do our best to answer them during the show and certainly after. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-host. He's the CEO and founder of Constellation Research, best-selling author of Disrupting Digital Business, regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, ZDNet, and other media publications covering topics of leadership, technology, and uh, software enterprise. And in my uh, humble opinion, one of the top futures to follow on Twitter at RWANG0. Welcome, Ray, to Disrupt TV. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm here with my co-host, Bala Ashtar, Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce, but more importantly, one of the top followers on CIOs for CMOs. And of course, uh, he's a writer himself, and you can follow his blogs as well on ZDNet. Uh, and more importantly, a personal friend. And we've learned so much each other every Friday with some mm -hmm. awesome guests. So who do we have this Friday to kick it all off, straight off from some interesting part of, conversations? Part of learning on Fridays is the uh, we're honored to bring the best and brightest folks that represent the industries on our show, and today's no exception. Dr. Daniel Kraft is a Stanford and Harvard trained physician, scientist, inventor, entrepreneur, and innovator. With over 25 years of experience in clinical practice, biomedical research, and healthcare innovation, Dr. Kraft has served as faculty chair for medicine at Singularity University since its inception in 2008, and is the founder and chair of Exponential Medicine, a program that explores convergent, rapidly developing technologies and their potential in biomedical and healthcare. Dr. Kraft is board certified in both internal medicine and pediatrics. He has multiple scientific publications and medical device immunology and stem cell related patents through faculty positions at Stanford University School of Medicine and clinical faculty for the Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant Service at University of California, San Francisco. He's member of the Kaufman Fellow Society, member of the inaugural class of Aspen Institute Health Innovators Fellowship, to top all of that, he's also an avid pilot, and he served in Massachusetts and California Air National Guard, and as an officer and flight surgeon on F-15, F-16 fighter squadrons. <laughs> oh my God, I have such imposter syndrome when I read about Dr. Kraft. <laughs> you can follow uh, Dr. Kraft, you must follow him on Twitter at Daniel underscore Kraft, D-A-N-I-E-L underscore K-A-R-A-F-T. Welcome, Dr. Kraft, to the Shrub TV. Great to be here. Thanks. Hey, thanks a lot for being on the show. Last time we met, we were at our uh, people-centered internet conference talking about you know, human rights in a digital age uh, and really talking about the future of medicine. So this week, a uh, big show going on, HIMSS, right? Uh, you've been going there for years. Uh, what are some of the hottest trends and concerns uh, from HIMSS that you saw this year from the event? I think the, the meta trend is we're now in this disruptive age that's coming to healthcare. We're not quite there yet. Where now we have the explosion of our digital exhaust from our wearables, our genomics, our medical health records. The trick has been to connect the dots. A lot of the data has remained siloed. A lot of the way I as a doctor or you as a patient connect to your clinical team is very intermittent and reactive. And part of the theme at Hims and beyond is how do we connect those dots to really reshape you know, health and wellness, diagnostics and therapy. So some of the hot trends are how do we enable data to flow? How do we make sense of it? Uh, so it's not just data, but it's actionable information, whether that's with AI. How do we keep it secure with things like blockchain? And then how do we reshape the industry to change instead of you know paying for every drug or procedure to pay for outcomes? So some of the meta, meta themes are blending technology with incentives and connecting the dots. You recently wrote uh, National Geographic uh, opening story in terms of 12 innovations that will shape healthcare in the future. Can you pick one or two or three of those innovations that you wrote about, all of them fascinating, to talk to us in terms of what you see as near-term impact in terms of healthcare? Yeah, it was last month's National Geographic is all about the future of medicine. And mm -hmm. my opening piece was, you know, not about any one technology, but more the theme of how do we blend them all together? You know, um, there's this idea that we're in the age of omics, and so you can now pick you know, your human genome, which you can sequence for less than $1,000. We're in the exponential age of you know, wearables, and I've got like 13 versions on me right now, including my ring. You know? And 
a bit of the point of that article and the sort of 12 technologies is that it's when you put them together to make sense of them in this new way. Um, it could be, you know, checking, you know, your sleep and your steps. That's pretty simple. Now connecting that with your genomics, with your internet of things, uh, with your social media feed that can hopefully move from our age of quantified self, where we, a lot of us are data geeks and we can track it on our smartphones, to quantified health, where your doctor or health care team will start to not necessarily look at that data in real time, but have what I call predictalytics, to be much more, instead of sick care, health care, uh, and be more continuous and proactive so that you'll almost have your own check engine light for the body to give you early warning before you blow a gasket. Um, and also to share that data, just like we do with Google Maps, to connect the dots to inform healthcare globally. That's yeah, awesome. The president of IDC here, Crawford Del Pret, and he talked about the concept of, what, what was it, Ray? Multiplied innovation. So Multiplied innovation. It's the application of multiple technologies concurrently delivering value and solution. And it seems like your article identified the multiple use of various emerging technologies to, again, create this preventative healthcare and, and, and again, move from curing to preventing. Yeah, is one of the technologies we highlighted there was the idea of, you know, these little, you know, almost digital patches, which are going to be a dollar a day. This is going to essentially give, you know, intensive care unit level of data streaming from you 24-7. Now, your doctor doesn't want to see your every EKG. I mean, you can do an EKG on your Apple Watch today. With AI, machine learning, and crowdsourcing, you can start to get new signals uh, Verily, which is Google Health, is now doing this baseline project, 10,000 volunteers, or the National Institute of Health. You can volunteer to be a data donor and sort of do a Framingham study on steroids because we need to learn what does this new digital exhaust mean. And in context, as we layer more and more of it, we can hopefully really get to this age of you know, precision and personalized medicine. So I chaired this program called Exponential Medicine, where a bit of the theme is things are moving so quickly Often we don't know how to connect them into the healthcare system, let alone the privacy and regulatory and other challenges. So it's often not a technology challenge, it's a people and behavior change pattern uh, that has to kind of get solved to move things forward. So I, I, we we're just thinking about this, we were talking about and brainstorming, you know, some of those big things that are happening in the patient care environment, especially with physicians. And if you think about what's going on right now, right? I mean. Doctors only really have 15 minutes to see patients, right? It's coming through really fast. And 10 of those minutes are basically pounding away at the EMR, right? But hopefully we'll get to this point where we get to like ambient computing, right? One of the, one of the cool things that could happen is you walk in, right? The sensors are already on you. The patients are already catching up, right? You're getting like vitals and stuff that you're doing and you're doing your H and P. And then, right? Meanwhile, the scripts that are coming out from the machine are really about trying to figure out, hey, you were here last time, maybe we should ask you this question. Hey, here's something that we missed last time, let's bring it up now. And by the way, we need to code up, right? We gotta code up, there's something we're missing here, and by the time we're done, right, instead of all that time wasted just typing things away, in the background, you're synced to your calendar, right? Mm -hmm. All your next appointment and follow-up visits are done, right? Mm -hmm. Your prescription set, the, the question goes, hey, uh, do you wanna go to the CVS or the Walgreens? Oh yeah, we'll do the Walgreens. Oh, your prescription will be right there. Just pick it up and you're ready to go. How far are we away from scenarios like this? Is this like you know, fantasy or are we like maybe three to five years away from this? And we're starting to see it happen. I mean, even Salesforce now has health cloud, so you can start to integrate some of these dots. I can now, this just came out at CES, this connected blood pressure cuff. That oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's watch. awesome. And ideally, you know, high blood pressure is the number one leading cause of early death and morbidity around the planet. So we're going to see these sorts of devices disappear where we have continuous blood pressure as one example. So when you walk into your doc's office, they'll look at your trends. They're going to know not just the number from last week, but what's been affecting your blood pressure. How do we tweak that? I've been working on a new technology, you can see the new, new TED talk, on 3D printing a pill that might have all your blood pressure medicines in it that adapts day to day based on that continual data. So part of this is now how do you layer the user interface and help the clinician not spend time again wasting time asking old questions, but seeing your dashboard of data with the insights, not just the data itself. And then again, just like we've done in other fields, education, music, uh, movies, gaming, to make this, the, the friction much lower so we can press the button and kind of get what we want when we want it. Hey, pharmacy of the future, personalized pills. That was awesome. So, You know, given that there are certain companies that uh, have excelled and, and, and have created great um, wealth by being able to have an early start in this algorithmic economy where they take data use the data and try to deliver value. Do you think that there's tremendous opportunity given the explosive growth of data and the fact that some of us are okay, comfortable sharing our data, 
that there'll be whole new business models where a company like Amazon could be one of the biggest players in healthcare 10 years from now because they know how to use that data. They know what we consume in terms of the food we eat at Whole Foods. They understand our, 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 our quantifiable self all day uh, with our shopping patterns and so on and so forth. Where is new business model innovation opportunities that exist given this adoption of AI and explosive growth of data? It's a tremendous opportunity. I mean, there's a slippery slope with the data side. Even your voice and your Amazon Alexa can pick up signs of mental health changes or a pneumonia. But I think there's tremendous opportunity because we miss so much in our reactive sick care system. We wait for folks to show up with a heart attack, a stroke, uh, late stage cancer. Simple changes, uh, whether it's your connected toilet or how often you're ordering a med on Amazon can give you this, these digital breadcrumbs, often called the, the digitome, that as we layer it together and we become comfortable, in hopefully safe anonymized ways, donating our data, we'll get back that Google map or ways to both personalize our journeys and inform the healthcare paths for everyone around us. So, you know, because we're touching our consumer, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Twitters all the time, those are gonna be valuable feeds. Who owns that data, how we share it is critically important, but I, I hope we don't get too fearful about, you know, un unleashing that potential. And, and we need to encourage everyone to sort of own their own data Potentially, it could be their blood pressure data. It could be uh, something simple to bring that to their clinician to get the doctors and healthcare systems today to accelerate this because a lot of it is already here. It's just not uh, equally distributed. Thanks, uh, this makes a lot of sense. So when we think about what's going on, like these societal and ethical implications are going to come, not just on how data is being used, but also how it's being donated, right, from a community benefit for research, um, or also thinking about, you know, the implications of, you know, where machines and humans play a role, what's your perspective? What, what should we expect in the next three to five years? Uh, what's important for us to design for uh, in terms of preventing maybe, I don't know, dystopian views, the annihil annihil annihilation of humanity, or something awesome in the sense that, you know, new types of cures being discovered? I mean, part of it is shifting, I mean, how we design the whole healthcare or sick care experience um, such that we're not, today we still use fax machines <laughs> primarily to communicate. So we need to architect, you know, the future hospital doesn't need so many hospital beds. We're entering this era of virtualized care. I mean, I have my antique Google Glass here, you know, that has not been a great consumer hit, but has a lot of consumer health applications. We're moving to the era of like medical tricorders. I helped design the XPRIZE for that, where you'll have devices at home that can collect and synthesize that without ever having to talk to your doc, giving you really triage with an AI chatbot. So, part of the, the hopefully non-dystopian world is that we'll have a bit of our own healthcare concierge, our personal chatbot that matches our personality, age, and culture, and can then flow continuously to give you early warning, to do better diagnostics, and then to manage a disease like hypertension or diabetes. So there are dystopian paths. You know, what happens when your insurance company or your worker, workers have your genome, which they can now sequence from your glass? Uh, what happens when, uh, you know, your, your personal data potentially gets crowdsourced in the wrong way. But overall, if we redesign things and align incentives, uh, we can really improve health and medicine globally. Uh, Dr. Kraft, in, in the last, I don't know, 15 months or so, it's clear to not just us in the tech sector, but society as a whole, that there is a trust deficit. S certain major brands have demonstrated that misuse of data uh, can can lead to um, you know um, un, un, negative outcomes. So as an inventor, as an entrepreneur, as someone who lives at the leading edge of technology in healthcare, what are some barriers to to innovation that 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 slow us down in terms of getting to a, a place where it's frictionless experience and we're being preventative in terms of making sure that we live a healthier, better life. Yeah, a lot of it's a human software problem because, you know, if you move someone's cheese, you know, Kaiser Permanente put these amazing navigation portals in the lobby to help you find the cafeteria or a patient. They keep getting broken or unplugged by the candy stripers, by the volunteers who are being disrupted from their jobs, just like the taxi drivers are upset with Uber. So part of it is, you know, how do you understand, how do you pay for things in healthcare? And there's no one healthcare system in the U.S. or around the world. How do you um, make these things feel seamless? Again, I can get goodles, oodles of data from my Apple Watch. How do we take that from data actionable information and sort through it? How do we um, narrow it down to something as simple as a personal check engine light? How do we um, incentivize this convergence of other fields? Like the, you, you guys know these people from gaming and privacy and blockchain and, and, uh, and VR and AR coming together to solve real healthcare problems. 
and, and put the user design element on top. So I think it's you know, a huge, huge set of challenges, but a lot of new energy coming into the space. We see that at Singularity University. We see that you know, across the platforms uh, where everyone's interested in health and has the opportunity to impact it now in, in new ways. Oh, this is amazing. So when you think about like the challenges ahead for like the next set of scientists, the next set of inventors in the space, what kind of skills should they bring? Is it more of a STEM background today or is it more of a holistic background in other areas uh, at the edges of different types of uh, disciplines? That's a, a great question. You know, how do you even think about selecting and training a medical student, a future physician, nurse? Do they need to know coding skills or do they need to know, you know, memorizing organic chemistry? I would argue we need to reshape and rethink education who we pick for some of these fields. So I think part of it again is keeping your mind across elements. You need to have some specialty, but understand what's happening in 3D printing, which is impacting healthcare from printing braces to orthopedic devices, to stem cells and organs, understanding basic coding, app development, um, how to integrate decision support. How do we blend what an AI can do well with what a clinician can do? So we're not replacing radiologists or dermatologists, but we're the, we're upskilling them and enabling access to some diagnostics or therapy in, in new ways. So I think we need folks to become multidisciplinarians and really understand the unmet needs. I trained at Stanford, went through the biodesign program. You really have to understand the clinical problem from the patient perspective, the payer, the pharmacist, the family member, uh, in order to solve it in, in impactful ways. Wow. Uh, last week, Accenture uh, published their annual report, uh, Technology Vision Report. And they said that in the post-digital era, in order for organizations, companies to, to differentiate, they need to take advantage of what they call dark power. It was distributed ledger, the D was distributed ledger, artificial intelligence, extended reality for you know, augmented and, 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 and virtual, and lastly, quantum computing, dark. If you have to pick one or two, or two, let's say, in your opinion, which one of the two of these technologies will have the most profound impact in healthcare? quantum computing, distributed ledger, artificial intelligence, or extended reality? I think it's sort of this blend of artificial intelligence and augmented virtual reality. For example, now, we can now take an MRI scan or CT scan and layer that in so when a surgeon is operating on you through a robot or otherwise, they can see the organs or the anatomy past where you're going to go, start to see AI guidance. Hey, don't cut that artery, move over to the left. Um, to be you know, transforming how we do medical education. I can practice a surgery in VR before I walk into the, into the operating room. Um, and then the AI agents are gonna start to become you know, doing the surgery for you. Uh, it's not, we've already seen the ability to sew better than surgeons, to give guidance from looking at thousands or millions of hours of video. So I think those two blending together, AR, VR, XR with AI is gonna really give us this new layer for clinical flow and even for individuals to sort of see their environment. I, I love the example I mentioned, I was a pilot in, in, in fighter planes. We have heads up display. It gives us a view of the world without having to look in the cockpit. Imagine our changing health behavior. You know, you look at your breakfast in one way, you have, now you have the AR layer and then the, you know, pull up sign comes on to kind of nudge you. Your, your the, cholesterol at 220. Would you like that? Would you like that done? It? <laughs> it's like, oh. and so I think it's you know, AR layer for coaching and interaction. For, for health in general, whether it's your Amazon Alexa or a, you know, a little video program on your phone can be super impactful. That's awesome. We're also seeing a lot of advancements in uh, robotic surgery, right? I was at Hopkins Ventures uh, six months ago, taking a look at what they're building. And you know, it looks like we can actually get to some interesting telemedicine and robotic surgery going forward. Uh, what do you see the risks of that? And what do you think might happen? I mean, are we, are we gonna change the way we certify physicians so they're beyond all the states and it can operate anywhere? Do you think well, that'll come soon or, or is that gonna, are we gonna be held back there for some time? Well, many things are held back by regula regulations that are old like HIPAA or uh, some uh, impedance on telehealth depending on state licensure. So in this exponential connected digital mobile age, how do we realign the FDA? How do we realign po policy? A lot of things will happen outside the US. China is exploding as you know with mobile AI medicine and chatbots and yeah. drones to deliver care. Um, so, you know, with robotic surgery, again, it's getting interesting. I could sit here now and potentially be operating on you, you know, in Colorado or Utah. Uh, and more and more of that will be with, with layers of AI guidance. It will start with, you know, here's where the tumor is, here's your step-by-step -step element. And eventually, like in that movie Prometheus, it'll yep. do the procedure somewhat autonomously. And that can democratize care. I can also mentor a surgeon in, you know, in Paris could be mentoring a surgeon in San Francisco or vice versa using a simple iPad. We're starting to see this blending. I can go into an operating room virtually with HoloLens and be with colleagues in new ways. So social VR is coming to the healthcare environment as well. 
Yeah, we're seeing some interesting announcements from Microsoft that might show up next week that will change the way you look at that. So some very interesting things to look forward to. So in that area. Well, we're here talking about the future of medicine with uh, Dr. Daniel Kraft. You can follow him, of course, at Daniel underscore K-R-A-F-T. And also check out his awesome TED videos. And of course, check him out at Singularity University if you're taking a course out there. Thank you so much for being on the show. This has been awesome. Getting a glimpse into the future of medicine with Dr. Daniel Kraft. Thank Thanks you. for having me. There's a ton going on out there. Lots of other uh, talks and resources at exponentialmedicine.com. Thanks, guys. Thank hey, you. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Wow. Post hymns. Yeah. A lot of that, exciting stuff happening. I, I tell you, I, I made a mental note. I got to research more uh, innovation use cases in healthcare. It's uh, it's moving so fast. It's so broad. It's it's incredible. And uh, speaking of incredible, we now have, uh, have the honor of having Maggie Craddock, president uh, of Workplace Relationship, uh, joining us on Disrupt TV. Maggie is an executive coach who has worked with clients at all levels uh, on the professional spectrum, from people entering workforce to Fortune 500 CEOs. Maggie's the author of Power Genes, Understanding Your Power Persona and How to Wield It at Work, and an, another exceptional book, The Authentic Career, Following the Path of Self-Discovery and Professional Fulfillment. We're all looking for that. Maggie has also written several nationally syndicated articles on behavioral dynamics in the workplace, and her work has been discussed in publications from Harvard Business Review to Oprah Magazine, which we get in my household. <laughs> Maggie has also been featured on CNBC, National Public Radio, and, and many other Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, and many more. She's a fantastic thought leader. You can follow Maggie on Twitter at M-A-G-G-I-E-C-R-A-D-D-O-C-K. Welcome, Maggie, to Disrupt TV. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Maggie, it's been great. I think you sent the book to us a couple months ago. I was reading through it. A lot of very interesting observations that people might not get right away. And I think it comes from years of experience in coaching. Um, your work focuses on power in that book. And how do you find power as it applies to people's careers? Because I think most people don't think of power as like the overt, explicit type of power, but you define it in many different ways. Well, Ray, I'm so delighted that you're enjoying the book. And, you know, I've been studying power for over 20 years. And in that process, I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with people in the military who would look at power from their ability to command loyalty and discipline, mm -hmm. spiritual leaders who see being able to inspire people as powerful, and many business leaders who will tell me that some of the most, most important historic figures that they look to are people like Steve Jobs or even Mother Teresa. So there are a wide range of ways to look at power. But where this really applies to business people is any power style comes down to the simple fact that power is relational. So to help our clients with this, we define power in a threefold way. We look at three dimensions. First, power in terms of your relationship with yourself. Second, power in terms of your relationship with others. And then power in terms of your relationship with organizations or the business world at large. And what makes it actionable is power in terms of your relationship with yourself goes to your ability to chart your own course professionally and not have that dictated for you by outside forces. Power in terms of your relationship with others speaks to things like your ability to negotiate conflict in a way that fortifies your personal integrity rather than diminishing it. Mm -hmm. And then power in terms of your relationship with organizations goes to your ability to align yourself with organizations that reinforce your core values. And of course, when necessary, make a healthy break with those that don't. That's true. Wow, that's a great, great line up there. Yeah, that's great segmentation. I think it was Steve Jobs who said the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. <laughs> as, as you work with these Fortune 500 CEOs, do you see a correlation in terms of the ones that uh, are able to influence um, and, 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 and demonstrate power to build consensus, advocacy, loyalty, commitment, are the ones that uh, are, are, are good storytellers? I think it's, it's amazing for people to be able to be good storytellers with others. And that's absolutely mm -hmm. critical. And we, we talk a lot, not only about the words people use, but even the verbal and nonverbal nuances of their presence in a room. But as important as the conversations and stories are that we tell to others, 
I always remind business leaders that the most important stories and conversations are the ones they have with themselves, the ones on the inside. Because the building blocks of any power style are your internal emotional reactions to a situation and then your out outer behavioral responses. So it's the conversations and stories they're having within themselves that go before the way they connect with other people and give them that agility to not just be focused on what they want to say, but how others are taking that in and if it's becoming part of another person's internal mm -hmm. conversation. Is that, is that part of being mindful when you hear people say, or, 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 or when you read about mindfulness is, 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 can I correlate mindfulness to the ability to tell sto stories to yourself and also be mindful of how those stories can shape the narrative or how we choose to connect with coworkers as an example? Well, yes, because I think where power styles kicks in is sort of where logic gives off. So often I'll have people say to me, you know, wow, I was listening to a business leader who I know is a brilliant person, but then the, the sense they made of this or the way they started telling the story with people wasn't really effective, didn't connect, didn't make much sense at all. And what was going on in that moment is that person was triggered by an emotional memory or something coming in from their past that goes to one of those power styles that even though we know they're brilliant, their brain flatlined in that moment and they didn't have access to the brilliance we all know they've got, right? So then they have to understand clearly where's that association, where's that piece of the story being embellished, right? And how present am I for the wider range of things that could be happening in this moment? So we look at where emotional memory, right, will bring you back to the present moment so that the conversation you're having with yourself isn't so loud that it's drowning out the way that others feel about themselves in your presence. That makes a lot of sense. Right, and you mentioned something really important in the book about family system conditions, right? And how these are actually changing, how family systems conditions are emotional instincts, right? And this is kind of interesting how these instincts kick in, right? So we have this natural reaction. And I remember reading way, way back in HBR, there are a couple styles, right? I think it was like a, a pleaser, a charmer, a, uh, you know, I, I can't remember, it was like a inspirer, I think, and a commander. And, and, and those tie back, right, to this. So can you kind of expand on the end? Because it's kind of interesting because, like, I, I find myself jumping in based, based on some things when I don't catch myself, right? Uh, because it's a conditioned response, right? But, you, but if you're a little tired or you're at the end of the day, right, that conditioned response does kick in. So It does. And, Ray, that's so helpful because we talk about the pleaser, the charmer, the commander, the inspirer. And in the book, of course, we define them and we talk about the strengths and the blind spots associated with all of them. And everybody's gonna have that conditioning that goes back to the family system. And a simple way for listeners to think about this is, just imagine what it was like at the kitchen table when you were growing up, right? Where'd you sit? Who talked the most? Who even had permission to say when dinner time started, right? You know, how did you feel about yourself in that dynamic? What were the interpersonal norms? What was the whole emotional tone of the situation like? Because whether we realize it or not, when we're a little tired, that emotional memory is cooking along with all the other complex problems that we're solving at the analytic level and everything else. But the important thing about these power styles is we all have all of them inside us and they morph and they shift. So in the course of a day, you're going to exhibit strengths and blind spots from any of these power styles mm -hmm. and things are going to change on a normal day when you're logical and you can remember all these wonderful cognitive concepts about how we should be reacting. And then just as you were saying, right, on a high pressure day, some of that stuff may reach out and you may not react the way that you think you will. I have clients say to me, I can't believe I did that. That wasn't me. And I'll be like, yes, that was you. And this is a power our style learning moment. So the clearer you get about that early conditioning, the more you're able to take all the steps and break down precisely what your emotional triggers are. And when you can do that, you're not just defaulting to that blind spot. You're able to actually stop in that pause and think of all the strengths that come from all the different power styles, not just the one you default to, and employ the one that's going to be most effective and most strategic in that situation. That makes a ton of sense. I should have read your book when I was promoted to a manager. <laughs> hey, you're flying um, to India. You can do that. <laughs> 
No, absolutely no, because because I think when you work and you you you, you, you discuss this in the book, when you're working, uh, you know, for a difficult boss or you're serving a difficult client, and difficult meaning strong personality, people that are you know high achievers, they're, they're successful, so they have blind spots and and uh, and they have their ways of doing things. But if you understood the power styles, you can adapt, uh, identify an early warning uh, and, and, and be able to create a more uh, successful re relationship. So can you talk a little bit more about being able to detect the power styles and how that can help you become a, a better professional and a better leader in the world? Well, well, absolutely, because understanding power styles truly helps people set a consistent senior executive tone. So that even if they're dealing with someone extremely strident and you were sort of leading to that kind of example, Vala, they're able to not just be blown away by somebody whose energy may appear more aggressive, but they're able to remember that, you know, what you see as your power style may not be the way that other people see you. Mm -hmm. And that the same goes for that difficult person. They may not be fully aware of how other, pe other people feel about themselves in their presence. They may not realize how strident they're being. And when you understand power styles, you realize that it's not about good and bad people. It's about effective and ineffective behavior in a certain moment, right? It takes a lot of the judgment out of the process and makes communication so much more effective. So if somebody's popping off and being, and being really loud and forceful in your presence, and you know your power style, and let's say you tend to be a little bit more of a pleaser, so you, you just are kind of anxious and you don't want that confrontation, rather than just shutting down, and appearing as if you didn't bring your A game to the table, which is just gonna further gin somebody up if they have a certain sense of urgency in a different power style, you're able to stay centered, look them in the eye, say something like, I, I appreciate your passion for detail in this situation, diffuse the situation and logically get effectively and succinctly back to solving the problem at hand. What's more, when you separate, your ability to continue to focus on your job isn't hijacked by an emotional memory. You understand your power style and theirs, and you save tons of time because you can go back and effectively focus on the next thing you need to do on the job. Is it, is it possible to mislead someone else's power style based on gender, age, ethnicity, um, so I, I can understand having over time uh, accurately understanding your power style, your own, but it, it, are they overlapping um, uh, assessment of others' uh, power style based on those factors? Absolutely. Before understanding power styles and before doing this work, I think a lot of people categorize certain type patterns of reaction as gender-based or ethnically based. And when they start to understand this work, they begin to realize that one of the most valuable things is a diversity of power styles, listening to all different points of view. But the other thing is for individuals who are coming to the table concerned that because of their external presentation, somebody's gonna make a, you know, prejudge them in some certain way, you become so much more effective at gearing the way that you want to deliver a message, to be succinct and focused when necessary, or to be a more strategic listener and make sure that others feel heard, that you actually manage to diffuse a lot of those snap judgments and get to the heart of the matter, solving a complex problem much more effectively. That was the, the earlier example was commander meets pleaser. pleaser, pleaser. <laughs> That's kind of funny, right? So you're thinking like, hey, how do you, it's, you're talking about this coexistence, right, of power styles that's actually happening. Uh, part of it's awareness of everyone's power style. And the other part is really understanding your own initial gut reaction uh, to make this work. So, so let's talk about how this is working inside organizations, right? Uh, you know, how is it, you know, changing workplace culture or helping people understand that culture uh, and, and allowing this coexistence occur? Well, I, I think that there are a couple of things that are happening. First, at the team level, people are beginning to understand um, how much money they save when they're bringing new resources onto teams, when they, they think about the power style dimension. For example, our clients are often saying to us, you know, now we don't just have the hiring manager look at their rapport with one individual. We're thinking about 
the rapport of that individual with everyone else on the team in terms of the power styles. Because let's say you're hiring someone, you may have a wonderful rapport with them, but then you put them on the team. And suddenly the way they go about getting things done in a group can actually cause some of those other alliances to break down. Because you may have someone whose power style is terrific managing up, right? But managing with their peers, it may not inspire the same trust or transparency. And so the ripples people, take off. So. so people are very thoughtful about how everyone on a team is going to understand this nomenclature, which is really simple intentionally, so that busy people can operate on the go under pressure and still remember it. Remember that they're looking at behavior. They're not judging individuals, right? So that's much more effective. It, it keeps people from giving up on a great job opportunity prematurely because of a little emotional turbulence when they understand what they're going through and adjusting to those power styles. And also when they're learning about a new culture, you wanna look not just at a role or you know the numbers that you're supposed to meet or this sort of thing. You also wanna understand implicitly the behavior that's rewarded in that culture, what kinds of people actually get ahead, why, how your power style operates you know, most effectively within that dynamic because your power style of your work culture isn't just gonna affect your advancement, it's gonna shape you as a human being and you're gonna carry that into the rest of your life. That's amazing. Um, when, 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 when you're engaged with a company, is it the CHRO, uh, head of human resources that, that brings you into the organization to do a cultural assessment, leadership assessment and, and guidance? Is it the CEO? And, and a follow-up question, do you feel that part of the most critical success factor for startups is to understand this dynamic, given the fact that, you know, uh, you know, one bad apple could completely destroy a company when it's that size? Well, yeah, in, in terms of how we're engaged, um, it's often someone in the C-suite, we're often engaged by word of mouth because we've done a lot of work with people in the C-suite because at the senior management level, the relational nuances that take place between senior executives and board members or how those management teams are interfacing are critical to profitability. And they have to understand this more at just the cognitive level. These men and women are under so much pressure that they must understand the relational nuances and how they're coming across and that gap analysis between how they hope they're coming across and how other people are actually experiencing them. That's critical in the C-suite. But more and more, and particularly with human resources, um, we're engaged to work with teams because we don't want this to just be a secret handshake in the C-suite. This is effective nomenclature that really prevents a lot of the lost time and energy that comes when people are brooding about how someone has reacted to them or whether or not they've dismissed them in a meeting. And they can get back to power styles and look at the behavior and tune in more effectively. And yes, for startups, this is extremely helpful. Now, I'm sensitive to the fact that many of the startups who have hired us and, and asked us to come in and consult on these issues are working with you know not the same large budget that you look at in some of the larger multinational companies. But it is absolutely critical to understand these nuances because many of them want, many startups have come from a culture that didn't work and they know what they don't want, right? Okay. And so they want to get on the ground floor in terms of establishing trust so that everyone on that team feels like they're working together as a united front and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Wow, we're seeing this actually happen and in humanity i'm wondering what happens when we get to uh, ai and robots will we be programming randomized power styles into the robots uh, see what happens you know yeah. simulations yeah reactive uh, you know pop, pop different people in those kind of approaches uh, the reason i'm asking is like business environment is definitely changing we see this um and, and you've been talking about this for quite some time um what is an example of success when someone has realized you know inside an organization when they've applied uh, power genes to their organization? I would say an example of success is, for example, a client that I worked with in technology. And this was a very, very uh, analytically brilliant guy. And he spent most of his career just hunkering down and writing code and producing things. But he felt like he was sort of capped, like he was sort of off in a cubicle doing his work and he re wasn't really yep. advancing. And he said, you know, Meg, I need some help with this because people are turning over so fast in my organization. I feel like I have to leave and come back to get ahead. 
and I don't really want to do that. That's expensive for everyone and really kind of stressful for me. That may be what it takes, but more and more people are have to, having to know their core strengths and reinvent their careers if they want to continue to advance. So he started looking at his power style and back to that kitchen table thing. He was someone who'd grown up with some of the blind spots of the pleaser, absolutely brilliant guy, zeroing in on what he needed to do analytically, but he didn't like a lot of confrontation. So he would isolate a little bit around this process. And when he started doing this work and widened his awareness of his full set of strengths, he realized he was a fantastic mediator. That's what he'd done in terms of keeping the peace in his family most of his life. So when he moved a little bit out of that comfort zone and began showing up in conversations, and at first he was uncomfortable with it, but I had to remind him, you're uncomfortable being overlooked for promotion as well, aren't you? You know, when he came out, he became a fantastic manager and mediator and was able to address a wider range of needs in his organization and got that promotion without having to boomerang to get it. Wow, we're here with Maggie Craddock, President of Workplace uh, Relationships. You can check out her timeless classic book, Power Genes, Understanding Your Power Persona and How to Wield It at Work. Um, and more importantly, catch her on Twitter at M-A-G-G-I-E-C-R-A-D-D-O-C-K. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing with Thank us you, uh, your insights. Thank you so much. You were terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. That's wow. Uh, it's a book I should have read early in my career, I, I, I must admit. Uh, there's so many things I could have done better. Uh, yeah, and we were joking on the, uh, on the, on the water cooler and the, and, the, uh, parts, and the chats here. You know, people can ask me, hey, what's your power style? Just like the way people ask you, hey, what's your spirit animal? So who do we have on next? We ask him what is We're a lion with us now. Uh, we, <laughs> it's our privilege to have Byron Reese. He's the CEO and publisher of technology research company GigaOM and the founder of several high-tech companies. Byron has spent the better part of his life exploring the interplay of technology with human history. The websites that Brian has launched, which cover intersection of technology, business, science, and history, have together received over a billion visitors. That's billion with a B. Byron is the author of a claim book, Infinite Progress, How Technologies and the Internet Will End Ignorance, Disease, Hunger, Poverty, and War. And his new book, which he launched middle of last year, uh, The Fourth Age, Smart Robots, uh, Conscious Computers, and Future of Humanity. He's a fantastic follow on Twitter at B-Y-R-O-N-R-E-E-S-E. -E -E. Welcome back, Byron, to the Shrub TV. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to have you. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Last time we were talking about your book, I think it was like May last year. I was talking some great stuff. Uh, let's, let's jump into some of the big thoughts, right? There's all this you know, public awareness now on artificial intelligence, right? We've got all these devices in everybody's house. They're all talking to them, right? So AI, jobs, where are we? Is it really gonna help us? Uh, are we gonna gain more jobs? Are we gonna lose more? What's going on there? Um, let's just start out with that because it's been the hottest topic, whether you're at Davos, whether you're sitting in, you know, at any event, where I just came back from IBM Think, um, top conversation around this. So you're right, that's like the big question, isn't it? And, and, and passions run deep on both, on both sides of it. I'm of the viewpoint confidently that these technologies can't, literally can't cause technology, uh, can't cause unemployment. And in the end, it's, it's what happens is uh, that they increase human productivity, they increase worker productivity. And, and it's hard to argue that somehow bad for workers to be more productive. I mean, if you think it is, then, you know, you should kind of lobby for, for laws that make people work with one arm tied behind their back, because that would lower productivity. It would create a lot of jobs, but the jobs would be lower paying because people's productivity is so low. So what, what I, what I think is fascinating is that if you look across 250 years of unemployment in the United States, with the exception of the depression, it's always been between five and 10%, always. And yet, I put a bunch of thought into figuring out like what the half-life of a job is. And I think it's about 50 years. I think every half century we lose half of all the jobs. So you have to say, well, how is it that we have managed to keep full employment and rising wages against a backdrop of constantly losing half the jobs? Now, what people say to me is that they say things like this. 
Look, technology is really great at creating new, high paying jobs like um, a geneticist. But what it does is it destroys low paying, low skilled jobs like an order taker at a fast food restaurant. Both of these statements, by the way, are, are completely true. But then people say, do you really think that order taker has the skills necessary to become a geneticist? And then they say, therefore, we have kind of this group of people who aren't prepared for the jobs of tomorrow because they don't have the training. And I think, that, I think that's the logical fallacy because that's not kind of how it works. What happens is a college biology professor becomes a geneticist and a high school biology teacher gets the college job and the substitute teacher gets hired on full time at the high school all the way down the line. The question isn't, oh, yeah. can the displaced person do the new job? The question is, can everybody do a job just a little harder than the job they have today? And if the answer to that is yes, which by the way, I think it is, that means you can never have unemployment. Technology will always create new jobs, destroy old ones, and everybody shifts up a notch. You cannot argue that increasing human productivity is bad for humans. And that's all AI is. I'll just say one more thing. Really all artificial intelligence is, like if you really distill it down, we take a lot of data about the past. And we study it. And we use it to make better decisions about the future. That's what it is. Mm. And if somehow that's bad for people, then you have to argue for ignorance. You have to say, oh, no, it would be better if we all didn't look at data about the past and we all made worse decisions. That's what this planet really needs. And, of course, <laughs> nobody would say that. And so – We need more We need more randomness. We need more data. Yeah, you <laughs> well, you, you've written – you said when 90% of people farm, the 10% that didn't undoubtedly looked upon those that did – as capable of little else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so you said, I believe that great part of workforce needs to be liberated from the drudgery of doing the work a machine can do. Right. Uh, so when we think about these, these deterministic, manually intensive, repetitive processes that should be uh, moved away from the creative human to a, to a robot, are there specific sectors that will have a job shelf life that might be less than 50 years? Uh, like, you know, 20 years from now, would, will truck drivers need to be reskilled or folks stocking shelves at supermarkets? Uh, yeah. You know, how I do mean, you get that free, frictionless, continuous flow that an Amazon brick and mortar store is trying to right. deliver today, where you just walk in, pick up, walk out, rest in peace, you know, cash registers? Um, yeah, on my website, ByronReese.com, I actually have a will a robot take your job quiz. And it tries to pinpoint, <laughs> the, it tries to pinpoint those jobs. And they, they look like this. Um, are two days of the job the same? Do you do the same thing in any given two days? Uh, would two people do the job exactly the same? Like a data entry person, you hope two people would do it the same, but a screenwriter, they wouldn't. Does the job require more than one second of cognitive thought? Um, if, it can, if, if it can be done in less than a second, a machine can probably do it. Shockingly few jobs actually can be done by machines. Uh, in most cases, the technology augments human labor. The big challenge isn't going to be robots taking jobs. It's going to be a shortage of humans because if we stopped doing anything with AI right now, yeah. it would take us 10 or 15 years just to take what we know how to do and implement it. And yet, we're not stopping. I'll, I'll just give one quick example. The web is 26 years old. The Mosaic browser is 26 years old. Yeah. And if, if you had gone back in time, and I said, Ray, in uh, 26 years, 2 billion people are going to be using this, what's going to happen to jobs? And you being, you know, as smart as you are, would say, well, I think the, um, I think the travel agents are going to have it rough, and the yellow pages are going to have it rough, and the newspapers and the postal system and uh, stockbrokers, and they're probably gonna lose their jobs. And you would have been right about everything. But the thing is, is that you would have never guessed eBay, Etsy, Uber, Airbnb, Amazon, Google, none of it. So you can always see the jobs that are gonna vanish and you can never see the jobs that are gonna be created. And therefore, we're a skittish species. And therefore we look at it and we're like, all these jobs are vanishing and I don't know what the new jobs are and therefore we're all screwed. And I just don't buy it. I agree with you. I, no. I agree. It's awesome. No, that test was great. I mean, it talks about how you make decisions, how much training you need for the job, how it's repetitive, where you're going. That's a lot of great stuff that's going on there. 
So. You know, and people get really caught up about schooling. Like, are we teaching our kids the right thing? Hmm. I'm 50 years old, and if I went back to the mid-80s to high school, and I knew everything I know today, there's only one class I could have taken that I would still be using today, like on a regular basis. Right. Wow, which one? Typing. <laughs> Typing 60 words a minute. And I know, it would be great. And who would have ever guessed? And so it's like everything I do in my job, I kind of learned on my own. And that's what people do. Like a raccoon can only be a raccoon and a snake can only do what a snake does. But a person can look at everything and decide. I mean, that's what we can do. And so it's like, it doesn't matter if Johnny can't code. What matters is Johnny can learn. Learn how to code. Wow. Well, if I take your quiz, my worry is that it'll show that Ray's going to have a robot disrupt TV co-host very soon. So. Uh oh. <laughs> but, 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 well, yeah. I think we're far from that. <laughs> like Craig Ferguson had that uh, that robot. Yeah. <laughs> But what I'm more worried about is like, you know, we've got the likes of the Kaifu Lees around the world uh, oh. talking about this dystopian AI future and the war. Uh, we've got other smart folks like we look in our uh, on our team. We're studying this uh, issue really about digital democracies versus digital dictatorships that's popping up. Right. Will the open world survive a closed, uh, very, you know, intelligent AI world? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Where, where, where are we headed? I do think there is cause for concern there. Um, and I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist. We, we used to all have some amount of privacy because there were like so many of us. You couldn't follow everybody and you couldn't listen to every phone conversation. But now you can, right? Like now cameras can read lips and, and every cell phone conversation can be transcribed. And the, and the same tools we use to, to look for cancer and tumors can look for political dissidents and phone conversations. It's the same thing. Um, you have to, in the end, though, believe that open societies are fundamentally better, that they will have more, more people will want to come to them and more people will want um, to contribute to them and they have a freer flow of information and it, that individual liberty promotes economic growth, that private property is, is an incentive for people to do more. You kind of have to believe in that it's all better. So let me, let me play the counter, let me play the counter. My, you, you know, your traffic times will be better, right? Uh -huh. There'll be less crime. You yeah. won't have to worry about shortages of goods. We'll ensure that we can give you your best optimal life. Come join us. It's like socialism in the 40s. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I. Diseases I will I, be cured. <laughs> well, I, I think you can have like a future with no disease and no poverty and still have individual liberty and freedom and self-determination. You know, in the end, people have to want it. Um, there's, a, there's a toll road near my home that I drive on. And every time I drive through that thing, it hits my badge and charges me 85 cents, right? It could run my license plate and see if I have any outstanding warrants. It could clock my speed and send me a speeding ticket if I'm going too fast. It could keep track. I mean, it could do all of those things. And so what we have to decide is that we want to live in a society where uh, it doesn't, and we have to make sure we elect people that support that, and that that we make sure that, you know the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. I didn't say that. I mean, I did just say it, but I didn't coin that. And <laughs> and and we can only kind of we can only insist that we want that, and we have to value it. It's funny. I hear <clears throat> I hear this statement that the young people today don't care about privacy. And my experience is exactly the opposite of this, because my father will open any email anybody <laughs> sends him. He just inherently clicks on anything. My, my son comes in here and looks, as, you know, won't talk to me if, if I have my desktop assistant on, right? He's like, come out of the room, I got something to say. I mean, not literally, but he's the one who's like, thinks I'm ridiculous that I give up my, you know, that I allow all these things in my life. And so... I don't really believe that cliche that the young people don't care about it. I think that they totally care and are clued in. Absolutely. I think they do. My, my kids definitely do. They're much more aware. Um, I think it's the generation above them that doesn't care as much. Uh, but I think these things skip generations over time. And so every time, you know, you're on, you're on the Texas one loop, uh, I hope, I hope even better that they just erase the information once they collect. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. That's what we have to lobby for. That's what we have to say. That's the world we want to live in. We got to fight that. We got to fight that with the cameras as well. That stuff gets deleted and hard. And to then you have to assume 
people in other nations will say, that's where I want to live. And then they come, you know, it's the marketplace of free ideas. You have to believe that totalitarianism in the end is not a better system. And I don't believe that it is a better system. This coming from Ray Wong, who has the most engaged, active digital footprint and exhaust of anyone I know. But, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but Byron, you have the privilege of interviewing and speaking with some of the brightest people, the biggest trailblazers and change agents when it comes to AI. What do you believe in today that you didn't believe a year ago? Because again, you're so exposed to some of the biggest, best minds in this space. I will tell you something that I learned that uh, I did not would not have guessed. And that is that, so I'm sure your listeners know there's really two, I think, two completely different things we mean by AI. One is uh, a spam filter or route my car through traffic, narrow AI, it does something for us. Mm -hmm. And then there's general AI, that's the, what you see in the movies. And these two technologies may actually not have anything in common. They may not share any code. They may be completely unrelated. No, and that's the one, by the way, that general one, that's the one that when you hear Elon and when you hear Bill Gates be afraid of AI, that's what they're worried about. Nobody worries their spam filter is going to take over. People worry maybe that technology is going to cost jobs. But nobody thinks it's going to like wake up one day and take over. Now, here's what I have learned, and that is that all of the people who believe that we're going to build a general intelligence, and I would say that's 95, I would say that's 95% of the people on my show, all believe it for a simple reason. Nobody knows how to, if you say, how do you build it? They don't know. But they, they start with the assumption that people are machines, that your brain is a machine, your mind is a machine, and consciousness, whatever causes it, is a mechanistic process. And if, if you are a machine, then someday we'll build a mechanical you. And then 18 months later, it'll be twice as good. And 18 months later, it'll be twice as good. So I find that I explicitly asked that question on my show and 95% of the people say, yes, I'm a machine. What else would I be? And then I put that same question on my website and I only get 15% of people say I'm a oh. machine. Why is that? Most people think they have something about them and you don't have to appeal necessarily to mysticism. A lot of people believe you know, Esther Dyson was on my show, and she was one of the people who said, no, I don't believe we'll make a general intelligence because machines don't have souls. And, and, and so she's one of like the 5% that don't believe we'll build this. Um, what happens when I bring this up to people on my show, they, they always say, I don't believe in magic. That's just magic. And I'm not sure it has to be. I, 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 you might be able to say consciousness is something that we may not be able to build in a fab. You know, it may be something that... Well, quantum computing might change that maybe, because maybe. because that, that need for, uh, you know, juxtaposition, that need for not having that definitive answer, mm -hmm. that probabilistic approach might be really how we work. Like, we're, mm -hmm. we're so random, right? That it's true. Random but you see, they, everybody oh, starts with the assumption there is, in the end, a mechanistic reductionist thing that makes us, and that's what we are. You know, it's... It's kind of like you better hope we don't make conscious machines because the minute you make a machine that can feel pain, the machine has rights and you, you can't t have it diffuse a bomb anymore. And you can't program it to want to diffuse the bomb either. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, look, I, I, have this, I, I have this urge, you know, I mean, and I'm not trying to be political. This is just to make a statement in a funny way. I mean, when we had all these people taking down statues of whatever, right, for mm -hmm. whatever reason, for whatever good point of view, I can imagine in the future conscious robots taking down statues of human oppressors everywhere. <laughs> like, we put them to work and never gave them rights, right? I mean, your point is completely valid. So and and, the, and the, the tricky thing is, is you would never know if they were conscious, you because philosophy doesn't even have a way to prove you're conscious, let alone whether a machine is. And you know, and we get to this, and we get to this point that gets even crazier. It's like when they get conscious and they realize that we're the unproductive species, we're the ones without logic, we're completely inefficient. Mm -hmm. I hope we made sure that we built the design point that says you can't kill a human, that Asimov's rules still apply. <laughs> Yeah, but again, see, you're beginning with that assumption that we're machines and that we'll build a machine to do that. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of people outside of Silicon Valley don't hold that view. Oh, and if we're not I machines, know. then then we are something um, they're just different than, than a machine. And there's a limit, therefore, to what AI can do. 
Uh, I don't. I find the belief that we're going to build a general intelligence to, in the end, be an article of faith. It's not a scientific proposition because nobody knows how it is that we are conscious. Consciousness, the fact that you can feel warm, but a computer can only measure temperature, is the last great scientific question. We don't. We don't know how to ask it scientifically, and we don't know what the answer would look like if we even knew it. And so, to think we're going to build that it takes a lot of a lot of faith. And note to our producer Aubrey. When we have Byron on, we need to give him more than 20 minutes because my mind is spinning right now. <laughs> Before. You're, it's a great, I, you're incredible. You're, oh, there, thank you. Your energy is contagious. Thank you, sir. You're always, incredible. Always, always riveting, always futuristic. We're here with Byron Reese. You can follow him at B-Y-R-O-N-R-E-E-S-E. -E -E. uh, I'll try to say hi if I hit my way down to South by. So thanks a lot for being on the show. Thanks thank for having me. Please come back. You were terrific. Uh, Ray, just incredible, uh, deep, deep questions, <laughs> multi-layered, deep questions. And the fact that he can simplify a quiz to just, you know, a, a, a very simple questions. And you, when you think about it, you're like, yes, I do spend two days doing this. Yes, this is repetitive. He's, uh, he's able to take complex topics and break them down to simple, digestible uh, thoughts and principles. He's, he's terrific. He's wow. terrific. We've got a power pack. Uh, show not next week, but the week after on March 1st, episode 138. Bala, which awesome folks do we have coming on board? Yeah, we have one of the best minds in digital marketing and growth. Uh, Mayor Gupta, CMO at Freshly. He was the vice president of growth at Spotify. And he's, again, an incredible uh, thought leader and futurist when it comes to digital marketing. We have Rhonda Bateri, President, Global Change Transformation Agent and Author. And Her new book comes out. We're going to be talking yes, about that. So. Exactly. And Nicole France, Vice President, Principal Analyst at Constellation Research, will come back and enlighten us, uh, an incredible thought leader herself. So On Insight Experience-Based Design. So Yeah, one more time. It's uh, Insight Experience Design. We're going to be talking about some yes. local site. So. Exactly. So we're off the air next week. Uh, both of us are traveling and uh, other sides of the world, but we'll see you in two weeks. Ray, closing remarks. No, man, this is, it doesn't get better than this. We've got some action-packed guests as well for March. Uh, so it's going to be a full lineup. And if you've got any suggestions, let us know. Startup CEOs, uh, big thinkers, authors, uh, you know, CIOs, CMOs, chief digital officers, anyone that's got an interesting point of view, that's where they belong here. Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Welcome to the Disrupt TV show and have an awesome week. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.